is for one thing that explains why Europe's approach to issues is so different to America's. And it's for one main argument to justify overclaiming of the science by certain climate change campaigns. It is, of course, the precautionary principle. Is it a hugely valuable tool for decision making in a dangerous and complex world? Or is it a well-meaning failure that stifles innovation and problem solving? Let's discuss. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Some of the problems we face in the modern world seem enormous. And some of the consequences of the things that we're now capable of doing can be equally so. So what difference does that make to how we approach decisions? That's a question that began to exercise people across the world during the 1980s. At that point, particularly on the environment, we'd seen a number of instances, one after the other, where some chemical had been introduced, used for years, and then very much after the event, we discovered that it had a major impact on the environment, on human health, or both. It happened with certain pesticides that put toxic residues in the environment. It happened with PCBs, very persistent damaging chemicals that started turning up literally everywhere in the environment. It happened with CFCs, which it turned out were highly efficient destroyers of the ozone layer, which is key to protecting us from dangerous UV radiation. Time and time again, it seemed that the same story would happen. A substance would come under suspicion. Companies that used the chemical would point to the fact that there was no definitive proof that the chemical caused harm. More research would then be carried out and eventually enough solid proof would come along and the chemical would be banned. You can understand why in that context it became somewhat unsatisfactory that the default position was to get on with causing harm because there was no definitive proof only for that proof eventually to come to the fore. When framed in that context, it seems a no-brainer to suggest that something needed to change. There have been some whispers of a precautionary principle as early as the mid-1970s, with an early focus on the 1972 Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment, but it really kicked into gear in the 1980s. In Europe, the idea began to take form in international conferences to discuss the protection of the North Sea. And the second such conference saw the adoption of the London Declaration, which in 1987 established the adherence to a precautionary approach. It began to appear in various international conventions, including the 1992 Earth Summit, and also began making its way into US and more particularly EU domestic laws. One of the most quoted definitions of the precautionary principle was framed in the Wingspread Consensus Statement on the Precautionary Principle in 1998. And it went like this. We believe there is compelling evidence that damage to humans and the worldwide environment is of such a magnitude and seriousness that new principles for conducting human activities are necessary. While we realise that human activities may involve hazards, people must proceed more carefully than had been the case in recent history. Corporations, government entities, organisations, communities, scientists and other individuals must adopt a precautionary approach to all human endeavours. Therefore, it is necessary to implement the precautionary principle when an activity raises threats of harm to human health or the environment. Precautionary measures should be taken, even if some cause and effect relationships are not fully established scientifically. So the key innovation here is that precaution should be taken, even if evidence of harm isn't fully established. And it sounds like a straightforward thing, you know, just an extra hoop or two to jump through, a little bit more time and bureaucracy to do something. But in practice, it has certainly been much more than that. The main reason why the European Union has historically banned genetically modified crops comes down to this principle. And indeed, it's why a number of practices that the United States considers to be perfectly safe are considered to be inadmissible by the EU. And as you might expect, environmental campaigners have been most vocal in support of this principle. For instance, this argument described by Robert Zimdahl in 2006. The essence of a precautionary principle is if one is not sure what may happen, caution is the proper course of action. In its simplest terms, it is look before you leap. 
Dundon 2003 is correct in his assertion that it is astonishing to see serious players in agriculture maintaining that one does not have to look before leaping unless one has a solid demonstration that a cost-effective looking is called for. However, the principle, self-evidently correct to some, has nevertheless been pretty vigorously attacked on a number of fronts. The first attack focused on the inbuilt ambiguity of the principle. When used as intended, as a principle to guide and govern decision making, its ambiguities can become a recipe for paralysis. In 2007, Martin Peterson pointed to a clinical trial that went seriously wrong the year before when six healthy volunteers experienced a hugely negative reaction to a new antibody drug. They all ended up in intensive care, possibly had long-term damage to their immune systems even after they'd recovered. He noted that such a situation could occur again in the context of a clinical trial. We nevertheless continue with clinical trials because the benefit of doing them significantly outweighs the risks and we simply can't get those benefits any other way. Any new drug will have at some point to be tried by the first human beings. But if a precautionary principle is used as a basis for decision making, it would prohibit the majority of clinical trials because it holds that whenever decision makers lack sufficient knowledge about the effects of a potentially dangerous activity, one should not proceed. And he then goes on to say that there's no real difference between using the principle to abolish clinical trials, mobile phones or genetically modified food. In each example, there's some scientific uncertainty about the possible long-term effects on public health. He says this, There is no doubt that a clinical trial might be dangerous and that precautionary measures should be taken to avoid unnecessary risks. However, the precautionary principle makes a much stronger claim about decision-making. It tells us to replace traditional cost-benefit analyses with a more imprecise reasoning that focuses on possible negative effects. The precautionary principle therefore replaces the balancing of risks and benefits with what might best be described as pure pessimism. The vagueness criticism comes down to all of the questions that remain unanswered even after the principle has been defined. When exactly should the principle be invoked? How much harm should there need to be in order to cross that tripwire? Is it any harm to human health, in which case it be really would be paralysing, is it only catastrophic harm? But then how do you define that? Where do you draw the line so that one group of people today don't draw it in a totally different place to another group tomorrow? And what about the other side of the balance sheet? What about the potential harm caused by a proposed action not being taken? Rational decision making weighs up costs and benefits and risks from a range of potential actions, including taking no action. Making a decision may involve complex trade-offs of benefits to different parties or assessment of probabilities of risk. But with the precautionary principle, those subtleties go out of a window. You just come to this presumption in favour of precaution. And as Conservative philosopher Roger Scruton pointed out, because you end up with a rule that, as written, forbids everything, it permits everything as well, since it forces us to frame everything that we want to do as an exception which means that the principle can be applied arbitrarily to prevent whatever initiatives the decision makers want to, regardless of any evidence to the contrary. This particularly works as an effective tool for decision makers who are not held accountable, which is why it's found such deep roots in the European Union, where the bureaucrats need to do nothing more than give grounds for concern inconsistent with the high level of protection that they themselves have decided upon. But it's not only in bureaucracies where it finds a home, but also in campaigning and advocacy. If you want to know how this gets used in practice, you only have to look at the example of Extinction Rebellion spokesperson Rupert Reed. Reed fashions himself as an expert on the precautionary principle. As an academic who's written numerous times on the subject, you'd expect him therefore to have a fairly nuanced and sophisticated view of the subject. Eh, not really. Looking at his public statements on this, it has truly become a catch-all. Rupert has argued that a precautionary approach would rule against nuclear power. He said that it would rule against genetically modified crops. He said that, of course, it recommends radical action on climate change. And indeed, when he was challenged a while ago by a climate scientist for quoting extreme outliers as though they represented the mainstream climate science, 
he defended doing that as well. I am explicitly saying that a sensible society will go beyond the scientific evidence to guard itself in areas where there is uncertainty, system complexity and high exposure to disaster. That is the precautionary principle. Basically, the precautionary principle is like a well-trained puppy. It will do whatever tricks Rupert wants it to do. And whatever the issue of the moment, it turns out that whatever Rupert already did or didn't like turns out magically to be supported by the precautionary principle. This was him writing recently about another topical issue. The basic point is that we need to consider the viability of measures through the lens of precaution and always err on the side of minimising the risk and scale of catastrophic harm. We should be willing to make huge economic sacrifices so that many of our fellow citizens don't have their very lives sacrificed on the altar of evidence and economic growth. You'll note that you can't tell from that which issue he's discussing. It's essentially the same argument every time. And it's also very much a political case. Lives are allegedly sacrificed on the so-called altar of economic growth. The value of economic activity in preventing harm to people is wholly discounted. In all his favoured issues, Rupert presents his preferred course of action as being devoid of negative consequences, while the thing that he dislikes, or in the case of climate change, the status quo that he wants to challenge, is seen as self-evidently catastrophic, even if the evidence can't currently support it. But of course, most of those issues have nuances which make the nature of decision making more subtle. I've talked in another video about how the continuing development of nuclear power, fourth generation nuclear, is making significant progress in resolving many of the objections to the technology. And if you're taking climate change as seriously as Rupert would claim to be, then the benefits of taking action on nuclear would be self-evident. With genetically modified crops, it seems that a major contribution to adaptation in parts of a world where climate change or even just frequent current climate patterns means that crops altered to survive drought better and provide needed nutrients could make a huge difference to preventable human suffering. Reed's extension of the principle as not just a break on new proposals, but also a challenge to the current status quo in the name of climate change, that's even more problematic. If you could frame just one potential catastrophic outcome for society, then maybe you could make a case for mobilising large amounts of resources in preparation for that one thing. It depends, but maybe you could. But at any one time, as we've seen, you can identify numerous such potential existential threats. Nuclear war, climate change, meteor strikes, pandemics, all of them are credible threats. And the question then becomes, how do you rationally allocate resources in a way that society finds proportionate to the degree of risk? So this is a pretty powerful argument against the precautionary principle, at least when attempted to be utilised by political players whose description of the choices and their consequences are somewhat rigged to fit their political objectives. Which, of course, is the point. It can't be a useful decision-making principle if it simply gets used to justify everything that the people in the room do or don't already want to do. But what about that original context, where we were always playing catch-up after the damage was done? Do we have to lose that apparently useful element and just go back to decision-makers doing their best and kind of muddling through? The answer is not necessarily. It does mean you have to redefine what sort of role the precautionary element has in decision making. Let's take that example of a clinical trial. You don't let the precautionary principle boss you into not doing trials in the first place. We've established that. But if you're required to consider the risks in the design of a trial, you might decide not to let all six of your volunteers take the novel drug at the same time. So if there are strong negative reactions, you can call a halt before you've exposed all of the participants. There's nothing much wrong with having a mechanism to get you to consider the potential negative consequences, nor indeed with a principle that you have to consider them and keep them under ongoing review, even if they're not fully yet proven by the science. But it's different to making that the sole factor in decision making. The point is that using the hard definition of a precautionary principle can lead to immensely perverse outcomes. So, for instance, banning reduced harm tobacco products because they cause some harm. 
even though they cause a lot less harm than the existing products and are intended to be a gateway away from those products. And we've seen that one in practice, along with many others. The precautionary principle tends to encourage us to treat risks as though they came singly from one direction only and never as a complex package where trade-offs need to be made. Roger Scruton again uses the example that by not taking the risk of angering your child, you run the risk of having to deal later on with a spoiled and self-centred adolescent. And also, rather than removing the risk, we can make the subject more resilient to harm. You can forbid your child to go near the sea, lest they drown. Or you could teach them to be a strong and able swimmer. The former is the one with zero risk. But generally, we probably recognise that the latter is the preferable option. So, the rational response to risk and uncertainty isn't to devote all resources to reducing one risk to zero. It's to balance costs and benefits, calculate likelihoods and build capacity to cope when things do, as they will from time to time, go wrong. That's the sort of reasoning we tend to use in life. It's how leaders have tended to think when in a real crisis. It's not how bureaucrats or campaigners tend to think because they're incentivized to show how a single problem can be isolated and solved. Which is only superficially attractive because the unintended consequences are hidden from view. So this is where I'm left. We still face some hard choices, obviously. We still have to solve some difficult problems, the nature of which people will argue about and dispute. But there aren't any automatic, convenient mechanisms to get over the fact that you have to deal with those problems. And that the best way to deal with them is with intelligence and with good quality leadership.